Hey, so today we're talking about pressure and fluids under pressure, which is getting close to the end of this unit. The success criteria for this lesson, what I hope you're able to do by the end of it, is tell me what pressure is and what some applications are of fluids that are under pressure. And actually, just right here in this uh, one picture, you can kind of see one application of pressure, and that is blood pressure, which is something that we use to measure cardio cardiovascular health, right? It's a, a warning sign, and high blood pressure can cause problems over time to things like arteries. Uh, so it's something that lets us know that there's a problem, and it's one application of pressure. So <clears throat> let's get into it. So what is pressure? Well, pressure is the force acting perpendicular to a certain surface area. Uh, and it's measured in something called Pascal. So remember that force is a push or a pull. Now, when I'm talking about pressure, it's actually only a push. Uh, and when pressure seems like it's actually pulling, that's just because of uneven pushes from two different sides. But Pressure is a push that is being exerted or put on a surface. And we're gonna actually take a look at that surface, but the really big thing to realize or think about as we go through here, that the amount of surface area that's under the force really matters. So if I have uh, force over a very small amount of area, that's different in terms of pressure than if that force is exerted over a large area. So we're going to talk about that, but that's like the big thing for this lesson. So how do we calculate pressure? Well, pressure is equal to force divided by area. So uh, force measured in newtons. We've dealt with newtons already before when talking about force of gravity and buoyant force. So measured in newtons. And then if we divide that by the surface area or the area that's going through that pressure in meters squared, then that is our area here and then we end up with force. So let's quickly talk about this. If we have one meter by one meter, that's a meter squared. So if I were to take a square like this, and I know it's a bad square, but if I realize that the height of this is one meter and the width of this is one meter, then the area is simply going to be one meter times one meter. And one times one is one, but now I don't have meters, I have meters squared is the unit. Uh, and that's a two-dimensional shape, right? That's the unit we're going to use for a two-dimensional shape is meters squared. So one Pascal, one PA, which is the unit we're gonna use for pressure, is equal to one Newton of force on a meter squared area. Uh, so, you can imagine a meter squared is actually being, oh, if I step back here a little bit, it's like, it's like this. Oh, oh, I, I'm left, right confused with the mirror image here. So, you know, something around that and then that. So it's basically like the square of where I'm at right now would be a meter. So a Pascal of pressure would be if I have one Newton of force on that one meter of squared area. And remember that one Newton is basically like how much 100 grams of mass would pull from gravity, right? So if I have 100 grams, the pressure you would feel holding it in your hand, that is actually equal to essentially a Newton. We're very, very close. It's a bit of an approximation. So one kilogram mass would supply a force of about 10 Newtons. Okay, so that's how much force would be on, let's say, my desk if I had a one kilogram mass on my desk. So if you had a 10 kilogram mass sitting on your big toe, given what I just told you, how much force would be exerted on your toe? And the answer would be, of course, then 100 newtons. If one kilogram is 10 newtons, then 10 kilograms will be 100 newtons. So now if we were to take a look at the amount of pressure yeah, that's being exerted on your toe. Well, then we'd have to figure out the force divided by the area. So the force we already know, that's going to be 100 newtons from this 10 kilogram mass, but the area we don't know, and we could actually figure that out by seeing how much of the 10 kilogram mass is touching your toe. So what area of your toe is actually getting pressure from that 10 kilogram mass? And the larger the area that's getting pressure applied to it, 
Yeah, then the lower the pressure is going to be because if I have a larger area dividing, I end up then with a lower pressure. So let's discuss kind of this whole area thing. Let's say you're falling from a roof. So you fall off the roof. What would you want to land on? You have a moment to wish whatever you want to be beneath you. What do you want to land on? And why do you think that substance might be better than something else? So, I mean, I'm guessing that none of you said, oh, I'd like to land on spikes, right? Because that would be painful. Uh, instead, maybe you chose something like, I'd like to land in a trampoline or in a pool or mm, a big old mattress, lots of mattresses, or one of those foam pits, a foam pit. And the reason why these are good choices is because when you hit that surface, a lot of you is hitting it at the same time. It's a large area that's in contact and it has give. Okay, so it applies that force, that pressure to you over a longer period of time once you hit it because it has some springiness to it. It's able to absorb that impact. Uh, so we can actually really see this whole area effect with a bed of nails. Now, when you think about a bed of nails, you think that it's going to be very, very painful and it's going to puncture through, for example, this balloon that you're seeing. But you're going to watch this video and it doesn't. Watch this video now. Okay, so the reason why it doesn't actually puncture through the balloon is because of the fact that we have a large combined surface area from all of the nails together, right? So because all those nails are touching the balloon at the same time, the surface area that's in contact with the balloon is quite high. So as a result, all the pressure from the individual nails is actually quite low. So pressure, again, depends on two things, the force and then also the area. Okay, and kind of as a summary, if I have a larger force, that results in a larger pressure. And if I have a larger area, that actually results in a lower pressure because that uh, force is being applied to a larger area, so it's not as high of pressure. Okay, and this just goes back to our formula, but higher area means that I have a lower pressure. So how do we actually compress a gas? Well, what we need to do in order for us to compress a gas is we need to have a sealed container so that no gas can actually escape. We need enough space between particles so it's not already compressed so that those particles can get compressed and closer together. And then we need some kind of pressure, external pressure, that is causing those particles to be pushed closer together. So for example, some kind of um, you know, pump or something, uh, a compressor, in order to force the air into that container. So what's happening when we put a gas under pressure and why are gases compressible in the first place? Well, what's happening is we're making those particles get close together. We are causing more crowding of particles. So gases can actually compress because there are large spaces between the particles, right? Uh, we got lots of space between the particles. So we can take the gas and compress it by applying some kind of a pressure. So in this diagram, if I had my gas here and then I had some kind of barrier in between that can move up and down, and then let's say I apply some force. Like let's say I put a big massive 100 kilogram mass on there and then it pushes it down to here yeah, and now these particles are much closer together. So now those particles are compressed. They are closer together and they're under pressure. Liquids and solids are not as compressible. Uh, and the reason why that they're really not compressible is because the particles are already very close together. So because in solids and liquids, those particles are already quite tightly packed, there's not a lot of room for them to get closer together. So applying pressure is not going to do very much, or at least the pressures that we can normally uh, supply to the material. <clears throat> Instead, when we apply a force to a, a solid or a liquid, what happens is it's like a domino effect of that energy gets passed along and transferred down the line, kind of like dominoes. So if you imagine when you apply pressure to a solid, right, it kind of just goes and presses here and here and here and here and here and here all the way to the end. So when I press this end, it makes this end move. Uh, and that has nothing to do with the clickiness of the pen. It just has to do with the fact that when I apply pressure on one end, it just transmits to the other end. 
And that's what happens in a solid and very much so in a liquid as well. So when I apply pressure, it doesn't actually cause compressing, it just actually causes the movement to occur. This is a little bit of an oversimplification. If you watch a video of, let's say, a golf ball getting hit, you will actually see some compression taking place and some warping of the material. Uh, but at the end of the day, gases are what we're talking about when we're talking about compressing a fluid. So how do we use compressed gases? We put a gas under pressure. How do we actually use that for useful things? Well, a compressed gas will exert a force back. It basically can like act like a spring. Uh, so when I apply a force to one end, right, then it actually, as a result, tries to spring back. So uh, this is great for, for example, air and tires to help cushion impacts uh, to smooth out the ride, right? By actually having tires that are filled with air, it acts as kind of like a spring or a suspension itself. So what that allows for is a very smooth ride. So you're not feeling every single little tiny bump. Uh, air pockets in shoe cushions, same exact thing. When you look at uh, shoes that have air built in, which most, uh, most athletic shoes do, that air acts again as like a cushion or a spring. So it helps to make it so you're not feeling uh, as much of the force from hitting the ground, but it kind of like compresses and then pushes back with every step. And so it prevents, um, you know, foot fatigue and so on. So it helps spread the force out over a larger area and it reduces the effects or the force of the impact that you feel. Another great example is airbags, right? Airbags uh, essentially are filled with air before the head hits. And they again uh, allow for like a springiness and to exert force over more time and so on. So they actually help to prevent injury by giving a cushioning uh, material for the head to actually hit. Uh, so airbags are another great example of application of compressed gases and pressure. So let's talk about atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure is talking about pressure that we just have around us right now. It's basically pressure that is currently uh, in the air. So let me ask you this and I'll have you really think about it. Which do you think would actually have a higher air pressure? Denver, Colorado, uh, which is 1.6 kilometers above sea level, or Vancouver, which is basically at sea level. Where do you think you'd actually find a higher air pressure? So what I mean by air pressure is the pressure from the air around us that is pushing on things all the time. And the answer is that Vancouver would have a higher air pressure, and the reason why is because there's more air above it. Right? What's happening with air pressure is all the air that's above us, all the particles are getting pulled down by gravity. And that pulling down by gravity is the reason why we have air pressure. You're feeling the weight of every single particle of air that's above you. It's pushing down on you. And the higher the altitude, the less air you have above you. And as a result, the lower the air pressure. At a lower altitude, you have more air above you, so you have higher air pressure. This diagram is great because it shows that all these particles here, right, are pushing down on you. These molecules contribute to the pressure weight at this altitude at the very bottom. Well, if I have a higher altitude, I only have these particles pushing down on me. So surface air pressure is equal to weight of air in column above that unit of area. So all the air that's above you, right, is pushing down on you, which is quite incredible. Now there's another side to this too. I went to Boulder, Colorado years ago, and actually because the particles are further apart, the oxygen content isn't nearly as high. So it actually, you get a lot more tired because you're not used to having that low of oxygen in the atmosphere. And I remember just being completely zonked the second day by uh, the low oxygen not being used to being on that high of altitude. In fact, athletes actually go to higher altitudes to train so that their body gets more efficient at uh, carrying oxygen around their body. So they get, as a result, higher hemoglobin counts and red blood cells and all that. So normal atmospheric pressure is 100 kPa. What's a kPa? Well, K means thousand. This is 1,000. So that means that normal air pressure on you right now is 100,000 pascals. So this means that you essentially have 
pressure that would be equivalent to 10,000 kilograms of mass pushing on every meter squared of your body. So if you had a meter squared of area to your body, which we all do, uh, that's 10,000 kilograms per meter squared that's pushing on you. That's an incredible amount of pressure, right? 10,000 kilograms is a lot. And we're gonna watch a video here of actually that pressure crushing uh, a big oil container, oil drum in a second here. So why aren't you being crushed? Why are you still able to actually be your shape? Well, it's because the pressure is balanced both inside and outside your body. So inside your body, you actually have equivalent pressure pushing, and then outside you have the pressure pushing as well. So because it's equalized on both sides, you don't feel that intense pressure, but you probably do feel an increase of pressure when you dive down underwater. Right? So if you dive down underwater, uh, you feel that there's higher pressure on you, and that's pressure, again, what's happening there is that all the water that's above you, as well as all the air above that, is pulling down by gravity. Gravity's pulling down on it, and you're feeling that weight on your body. But as long as it's balanced, you're fine. This is a big thing when we talk about diving, right? like scuba diving. Uh, and going down beneath the surface a large amount that we got to make sure um, that pressure is always equalized inside and outside the body because if it's not, uh, it can kill you. Really bad repercussions like um, gas coming out of your blood and stuff. It's, it's crazy. So <clears throat> because of equalized pressure, you don't feel that pressure. You don't feel the atmospheric pressure around you. It is the same. So we measure air pressure with something called a barometer. Uh, what a barometer does is uh, typically, you know, old school barometers, and they're still out there, use mercury. Uh, and what happens is that the mercury has this tube, right? It's got a tube, and there's kind of air right here. Uh, and then this is exposed to the atmosphere. And as the atmosphere pushes down because of higher pressure, then as a result, the mercury level gets higher, and this gas up here gets compressed. And so we can make readings on this glass tube. So we can have readings all along here that tell us then how much pressure is in the atmosphere. So if this goes higher up, then that means that there's more atmospheric pressure because it's being, it's pushing down, the atmosphere is pushing down on this mercury, causing a higher level here. If the air pressure is lower, atmospheric pressure goes down, well then as a result, this is going to go down as well. So that's called a barometer and it's used to measure pressure. Now, of course, now we have electronic sensors and stuff that do this for us. Uh, but even if you go to the, actually the Medicine Act College, you'll find one of these old school barometers that's really accurate that shows the air pressure. So let's talk about balancing forces some more. Uh, if the air pressure on the outside of a container is greater than the pressure on the inside of the container, the container will collapse. And we're going to watch this video of an oil drum collapsing. And what's happening here is that air is being removed from the inside of the container. So that pressure is no longer equalized. So um, basically, you're exposing the outside of this oil drum to atmospheric pressure by taking the air on the inside out of it. So it's experiencing that 10,000 newtons of force per meter squared pushing in on the oil drum, which is an incredible amount of force. So here's the video. So how does this apply to a juice box? When you, when you uh, get juice out of the juice box into your mouth, how is that working? How does that take place? Does this relate? The answer is yeah, of course it does. So what's happening is when you're uh, sucking on the juice box, right? As a result of you taking materials out, the pressure, the atmospheric pressure is actually collapsing the juice box. So really all you're doing is you're just allowing some of the atmospheric pressure to squeeze that in order to get the juice out. So yeah, it's just all about pressure being equalized on both sides, which is kind of neat. Uh, when you think about suction cups, right? When you press a suction cup on something, it's not actually that it's sucking, um, it's instead that the pressure of the atmosphere is pushing it down. That's really what's happening, is it's pushing it against the surface, and because it's not equalized on the other side where the suction cup is, it sticks there. So what you're getting is actually atmospheric pressure on that. Anything that deals with suction, that's basically how it works. Really, it's not, it's not the sucking necessarily, it's the atmospheric pressure that causes the phenomenon to take place. All right.
So um, that's really it for pressure. We're going to do some work in the future about uh, how to use this formula and make the calculations. But hopefully what you learned today is what pressure is. It's a force over a area, right? A two-dimensional area. Uh, we find it by taking force and dividing it by the area. Our normal unit for that is a pascal or kilo pascal, where kilo means a thousand. So when I say kilo pascal, I'm really saying thousand pascals. Uh, you learned about some applications of pressure when it comes to things like the shoes and the tires. Uh, and air bra airbags, sorry, you learn that in order to compress a gas, and we can't compress solids or liquids very well, but in order for us to compress a gas to put it under pressure, we need a closed container, we need an external force, and there needs to be spaces between particles. The gas can't already be compressed. Uh, and then from there, you learned a little bit about atmospheric pressure, which is just pressure from normal particles in the atmosphere. And essentially what it's because of is all the, all the particles that are above us, all the gas that is above our heads right now. All right, well, that's it for today.